Our next presenter is Julie Pash from North Dakota State University. Julie recently took over as the Neil C. Dudmanstead Endowed Chair of Potato Pathology, and she's really looking forward to working closer with the potato industry, and we're thrilled to have her here today to talk about her work. Julie will be presenting on the current status of fungicides for the management of early blight and brown spot. Please take it away, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pashy, potato pathologist at North Dakota State University. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be here. I'm going to talk to you today about fungicides for early blight and brown spot. This work was started by Neil Goodmanstead at NDSU, and we have continued over the past year or so. There are several foliar diseases of potatoes, but I'm going to focus on early blight and brown spot. These are both caused by alternaria species. Early blight is caused by alternaria solanoi, and brown spot is caused by what we know now as a complex of at least three alternaria species, alternaria alternata, alternaria arborescens, and alternaria tenuissima. These are foliar symptoms of early blight pictured here. They are characterized by dark, circular to angular spots and oftentimes have concentric rings. Lesions become restricted by the leaf veins that give them that angular appearance. Sensing plants, um, situations with low nitrogen, plants weakened by other diseases, these are the sorts of, of, of plants that are most susceptible. Also, some cultivars are very susceptible, really the early maturing types, and a good example of that is ranger russet. As I mentioned earlier, brown spot is really caused by a pathogen complex of at least three alternaria species. At this point, we do not know how to distinguish symptoms from these three species. We generally believe that each of the species is uh, equally aggressive at causing brown spot symptoms, although there's really a lot we don't know about this pathogen complex as a whole. Picture here are scores of the three species found in the brown spot complex. A few years ago, Dennis Johnson's group from Washington State found three alternaria species on potato in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. In 2020, we evaluated samples received from across Canada, and um, we evaluated 23 isolates from those samples and found that alternaria alternata was predominant, but certainly that alternaria tenuissima and arborescens may be important members of the complex in the Canadian population. Now, certainly this is not very many isolates, um, but it is interesting to me that it matches up quite well from the data we have from the United States. Uh, we collected isolates from approximately 2000 until 2017 and evaluated 123 of those isolates. And again, found that Alternaria alternata uh, was predominant, about 60% of the isolates in the population, um, but certainly Alternaria tenuissima and arborescence are important members of the complex. Uh, it's interesting that this uh, ratio of, of the species has been maintained over time. Uh, I also want to note that if you take a look at the pictures here, the really the large number of spores, those oblong dark structures that are produced by these pathogens, um, these are important in the disease uh, complex. These are symptoms typical of brown spot in the picture here. The lesions tend to be very similar with early blight and really are indistinguishable uh, in the early uh, development of a lesion. Really, when you can tell the differences, as the disease progresses, early blight lesions will expand, and brown spot lesions will not. They usually remain small, maybe even three to four millimeters. Um, also, because these small spored alternaria, as we call them, have smaller spores, and um, they do not have a, what we call a beak, like alternaria salami spores do. Um, it, it basically, that beak kind of acts like the tail on a kite. And so the larger alternaria salami spores with that beak uh, tend to travel further. The brown spot um, pathogen, the small spore alternaria spores do not travel as far. And so you, sometimes you get this bunchy appearance where you get a lot of lesions that are formed in a small area that tend to coalesce and it really makes it difficult to discern these from, from early blight, from those larger early blight lesions. The disease cycle for early blight and brown spot are basically the same. We just show you, this is, for example, here is the early blight disease cycle. So starting in the upper left-hand corner, um, spores are produced mainly on plant debris from the previous season, and they're carried by wind in the spring. As I indicated earlier, the small spore and species don't tend to travel as far as 
as alternary salami that they're bringing blood pathogen. The spores are produced under a wide temperature range where really we're looking at um, as low as 5C to 30C. But alternating, uh, alternating wet and dry periods favor spore formation and uh, disease development. Also, free moisture or some bleak wetness is required for spore germination and infection. But this can occur in as few as eight hours. The amount of sporulation increases with the increasing time of that wet period. So the longer the wet period, the longer that dew or um, wetness on the leaf, the more severe disease is going to develop. There are some efficacious management practices for early light and brown spot. Um, really, uh, the most important thing is to start by avoiding susceptible cultivars when you can. It is very important to stay ahead of these diseases. Once you get behind them, it's really difficult to manage. So that means that scouting is important. But really, let's think about scouting smart. Okay, so as I indicated that during the, in the disease cycle, um, that these spores are blown from crop debris from the previous season, mainly. And so that is where we should start our scouting, on that field margin along where the, the previous crop was grown. Early light also will try to hide, if you will, in the lower canopy. It starts in the lower canopy where our dews are more, are more prevalent and longer lasting. So it's important to dig into the canopy when we're scouting and really look at those lower leaves for lesions. Early light can be found in the mid and top of the canopy, and when it gets up in the upper canopy under conducive conditions, it can be extremely hard to manage. We really want to avoid getting to that point. But if you do get to that point, you're probably going to have to look at shortening up on the interval between fungicide applications. So if you're, you've been all operating on a 10-day fungicide application, you may need to shorten up to 7. Or if you're on 7, you may need to shorten up to 5. You also may, may need to incorporate um, a specialty or a premium fungicide for the management of early life. In this table, I've split the fungicides into two general groups. On the top, the maintenance fungicide, which include multi-site mode of action chemistries like chlorothalonil and megazeb. In the bottom section, I have included what I'm calling specialty fungicides, um, those single-site mode of action chemistries. Um, this certainly, this list is not all encompassing, but this is generally the groups that we lean on for early blight and brown spot management. This table provides a little bit more in-depth information about the fungicides. Um, the active ingredients, the target site, and the relative efficacy. What we've done here is rate the relative efficacy of these fungicides uh, from minus, basically not efficacious at all, which I am not included here, uh, to four plus, which are the most efficacious fungicides that we've evaluated. So a note of caution here that these fungicides were tested and these uh, relative efficacy ratings are made under our irrigated situation in North Dakota, and certainly that situation might change in your, in your um, specific situation. This list is also not intended to be all-encompassing, but is really what we've generated data for at NDSU. So the fungicides, if we start uh, on the left-hand side, those fungicides with an asterisk uh, are not labeled in the U.S. So I'm extrapolating the efficacy. You can see kind of the question mark with the parentheses uh, there on the, on the right-hand side. Um, I'm extrapolating that information from what we know about similar products that are registered in the U.S. So for an example, we don't have a Provia top register uh, for folder applications, but we do have some greenhouse data uh, that indicates that salatinol, uh, that same active ingredient, uh, provides similar control as fluopyrin and adepidin. So we really feel like we can get that, that four plus rating and certainly, again, with um, uh, some idea that your conditions might be different than what we've seen. Uh, also, uh, in the U.S., Provisol, is uh, is registered, but that the same active ingredient as is registered as Seviac here in Canada. So as I talk about Provisol later, um, you really are looking at that same active ingredient in Seviac. We also have a different mix partner with Adepidin, uh, and so we have Miravis Prime registered in the United States, where you have Miravis Dual registered up here. Again, uh, from what we know about those mix partners, we think that we can give it a, a tentative four plus rating. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to Scala as we move down the list there. Uh, pyromethanol is the active ingredient, and where we really have found that that is quite good on brown spot. 
still, still um, reasonably good on, on the early bud as well. Uh, for comparison, on the bottom I have what is listed as various, um, the Megazab and Chlorothalonil, and we've given that a rating of 2 plus, uh, so you can kind of judge uh, where those others would lie in comparison to, to the Chlorothalonil and Megazab. Um, and we really, really consider these as maintenance fungicides that we fit well working in alternation as well as tankers with those um, more specialty or what we would call premium fungicides. So now I'd like to share with you a little bit more about what we know about each of these specialty or premium fungicide groups. So starting with the QOI uh, group 11, uh, in the United States, we know that we have reduced sensitivity to QOI fungicide. It's very widespread and it's been stable really across about the last 20 years. I believe the same situation is true for Canada. QOI resistance in alternative salini was uh, first reported in 2007. Uh, in 2020, we evaluated 42 uh, alternary salinity isolates and found um, the mutation for reduced sensitivity to QOI fungicides in all of those isolates. Um, also, we know that reduced sensitivity and resistance uh, have been found in those small sport alternary species. So products like azoxystrobin and pyracostrobin were once considered premium, but unfortunately, we do not consider them that anymore. So next, let's take a look at the SDHI group, group seven. Um, we know that there are five mutations that affect the um, sensitivity of alternary salani to SDHI fungicides. Each fungicide in this group um, reacts a little bit different to each one of these mutations. So just indicating that you have a mutation doesn't mean that you have resistance or reduced sensitivity in your population to a specific SDHI fungicide. In the, new, in the United States, we know that nearly all of our alternary salami isolates carry one of these mutations. And basically all, um, or if not close to all of those isolates, also carry the mutation for reduced sensitivity to QOI fungicides. In the Canadian population, or eight alternary salami, the 40 blood pathogen, that we evaluated, um, approximately two-thirds of the 33 isolates that we evaluated um, I had one of the four mutations for that uh, results in some reduced sensitivity or resistance to, to the SDHI fungicides. Um, we only found four of the five uh, total mutations in that population, but again, not, not very many um, isolates evaluated. Reduced sensitivity or resistance to SDHI fungicides also has been observed in the small sport species, those species that cause brown spot. To my knowledge, no resistance has been found to DMI fungicides like diphenaconazole and metconazole across the uh, populations in the United States of, of alternaria salani um, or the small sport alternaria uh, species that cause brown spot. I'm not also not about, uh, aware of any evaluations that have been conducted in Canada to look at DMI fungicide uh, resistance. The only AP or analoperimidine fungicide that has been really evaluated is pyromethanol. And reduced sensitivity was observed in alternary salani, as well as alternaria alternata in Idaho in 2010. Uh, this was a low frequency of isolates that were found to be reduced sensitive. Um, some work done at NDSU by one of Neil's graduate students uh, it indicated that six of 245 isolates had um, some reduced sensitivity to pyromethanol and those were alternary salani isolates. None of the small forward alternary species had any uh, reduced sensitivity or resistance to, to pyromethanol in those studies. I would like to shift gears a little bit and talk about these fungicides and how they perform under field conditions. NDSU has been evaluating fungicides for early blight management for over 20 years. This year, we added um, a brown spot trial, a small trial, our ultimate goal really here is to improve the overall fungicide programs for growers. Really not just look at um, one fungicide versus another fungicide, but really how it, look, how it looks um, over the course of the season and how it fits into what a grower would apply. Our trials are inoculated um, and performed under irrigated conditions, so we really have pretty high disease pressure. Uh, we plan for 10 fungicide applications across the season. The first two applications are applied before row closure, and typically for us that occurs 
uh, around that first week of July for the first application. So I show you these pictures to give you an idea of that typical disease progress, what it looks like under our uh, trial conditions and where we evaluate these fungicides. Uh, I, I would say that the disease pressure is high. And here you have a picture taken at the end of August, uh, the first part of September, and then into that first or second week of September. And this is a non-treated uh, plot. And so really you can see that we have no complete uh, and utter defoliation of that, tr that uh, plot um, by the second week of, the, of September. So for comparison, these plots are from that same trial uh, and photographs obviously taken on the same days. And here we have used uh, what we would call a premium fungicide program. Well, that was similar to what we would recommend to our growers with um, two applications of a premium or specialty fungicide, uh, tank mix, and alternated with the maintenance fungicide that we talked about earlier. So the next part of that continued validation of the grower recommendations was determining if the specialty or premium fungicides we're really providing any benefit over uh, those single site, um, or excuse me, those multi site fungicides, chlorothalonil and Nacazab. So we have four groups of treatments that were compared here um, two groups of, of specialty fungicides, one mainly using QOIs, the second using uh, SDHIs and DMIs. The specialty fungicides were compared, um, were applied either two or three times um, and tape mixed and alternated with chlorothalonil and Nacazab. The trials were conducted um, under situations where there were still sensitive pathogen populations. So these trials were conducted over many years, um, whether that be the QOI sensitivity or the SDHI sensitivity. So those choices of fungicides under those specific categories were really fluid across the 13 years the trials were conducted. These were compared with, of course, non-treated and then the, the um, treatments of just standard fungicides of Chlorothalonil or Megazab uh, applied for all of those 10 applications across the growing season. So here's some results from those studies. Um, the table illustrates the effect of the application of each fungicide group, so non-treated, the standards, the specialty group one, and the specialty group two, um, at two time points during that early um, tuber balking and the late tuber balking. Um, first, the early tuber balking, uh, where the non-treated had about 30% early bolt severity. Those standard fungicides reduced that to 8%, but the specialty for fungicides reduced that to about 5 um, The severity, of course, is, is higher later in the season when we get to that late tuber bulking stage, but the same trend is, um, is in place here where you have those specialty fungicides really providing um, a better efficacy. Yield in that far right column where you're comparing, you're increasing uh, your yield by about three to four metric tons per hectare with, with the use of those specialty fungicides. More results here from that study, but we're looking at uh, specific comparisons of two uh, fungicide treatments. So on the top, we have the specialty fungicide group one versus the non-treated, where you're getting an increase of, uh, or I should say a decrease of 75% uh, early light at uh, that late bulking uh, to the maturation stage with the application of the specialty group fungicides. And when you compare uh, the standard fungicides to the non-treated, we were looking at about a 40% increase. And then on the right-hand side, we're looking at yield and um, where we have that change in yield. And the first column, the mean, is just that, the average change in yield from uh, the comparison of the two groups. And then the lower and upper are really showing that um, what the lower range uh, or the lowest change uh, would have been uh, in a single trial versus the highest uh, increase uh, in yield that you would have seen with the, for example, with the use of the specialty fungicide one versus the non-treated in that top row. And so really here you can see that that um, a 9% increase in yield certainly is beneficial with the use of those specialty fungicides. Now I'd like to move into showing you some actual field data of uh, these programs, these fungicides and programs that we've been talking about. So this is just an example of a trial that was conducted uh, in um, 2020. So we always include a non-treated for comparison and then either at least um, a full season of Mecazeb or chlorothalonil and sometimes both. That fourth treatment is what we would consider uh, an example of a uh, Standard treatment we would recommend to growers under, again, under our scenario of really moderate to high, really light uh, disease pressure. 
And so we would uh, um, recommend that incorporation of two specialty fungicides. And here we're looking at uh, Luna Tranquility, of course, tank mixed with uh, MANS-8, and then uh, Scala at application 7, again, tank mixed. Uh, it, it, we don't consider that first application of Quadris as what we call a premium or specialty fungicide for uh, early bite because we do have uh, resistance to that chemistry. That really, uh, that Quadris application at number two is really aimed at black dot management. Uh, we also have some pretty severe black dot uh, in, in our region. And typically what we find uh, that works best is the mid-rate of Quadris, uh, the low rate doesn't seem to get quite as good of efficacy, and the low rate uh, has performed as well as the high rate for us in the past. So we recommend that mid rate rate uh, there. We also recommend, uh, of course, as I said, uh, tank mixing with specialty fungicide, and then here they alternated um, with with echo if indeed that's just in this example. There are many options, of course. Here are the results from that trial, and I kind of like to just explain here where um, how we rate the trials. Uh, so the left is uh, a graph showing the progression of early bud across the growing season. So from the, from mid July when we start our ratings, where there basically is no disease, up until um, that last uh, fungicide application is made, and again those same four treatments um, that non-treated uh, that the Echo ZN here applied full season um, and uh, Mandate applied full season, and then the Luna Tranquility at application five, and Scala at application seven. And are in that in that box that you see there. That's really that critical time point uh, that we see those differences. Uh, in the example I gave in the previous slides. And so what we do in the right hand side is take um, the the area underneath each of those curves the early bite severity curves, and calculate that total area. And then from that, we, um, we get a relative value uh, based on the number of days that we have recorded across the growing season. And then we can, we can uh, compare our results across each season using that relative value. And that's what's shown in the bars on the right-hand side, where we can see statistical differences uh, between each of the treatments where our specialty fungicides are significantly reducing the um, progression of early bite across the, the whole growing season, not just at one time point. This trial was done in 2019 at our irrigated research site in North Dakota. Um, here we're comparing Provisol, it's registered in the U.S., but it, as Sevilla in Canada, um, with headline at application two, and there was no significant difference um, Remember that this application is aimed towards early light, that, that second application of the season. We're also comparing Luna Tranquility, Provisol, or Sevia uh, with Miravis Prime at, at application five. And even though the differences were small here, uh, Provisol did provide, uh, or excuse me, Provisol or Sevia did provide significantly um, lower early light uh, than did uh, the other two, than did um, Nervous Prime and, and Luna Tranquility. Uh, two applications of Provisol at when we applied it at number three and number five was not significantly uh, better at managing early bite than was just one application at number five. So this trial was interesting, but because we were looking at the residual activity of Provisol or Sevilla compared to Luna Tranquility, and this trial was conducted in, in 2018 again at that irrigated research site. Applications of the premium Premium fungicides were made um, at uh, 7 days, 14 days, and 20 day, 21 days. And here there was no alternating partner. So this is not certainly something we would recommend to growers, but it was specifically just to look at that residual activity. So this was uh, compared to one of our grower standards. Um, both Provisol and Luna provided uh, equal uh, or better control than the, the standard program. But here um, Provisol provided significantly better uh, in all three application intervals, uh, better than, than Luna Tranquility. So even at 21 days uh, between the application of Provisol uh, or Sevilla uh, in Canada, um, it really provided great control of early bite, really showing that uh, it has some residual activity. These are results from our first brown spot trial um, conducted in 2020. And um, as I indicated, it was a small trial, uh, just a couple of treatments, but here, 
This indicates that uh, lunar tranquility uh, applied at five and Scala applied at application number seven is er comparable or equal to two applications of Scala at uh, one at five and one at seven. As I mentioned earlier, we inoculate these trials, and so because we've done so many early belt trials at this site um, over the many years, there's a lot of, a lot of inoculum, but like we talked about, the, the spores for early white and brown spot um, come from debris from a previous cropping year. So here we have a situation where we have a lot of inoculum coming from that previous cropping year at that same site. So to ensure that we're measuring really uh, measuring brown spot, uh, even though these uh, trials are inoculated, um, we wanted to be certain of, of the pathogen that we were actually actually uh, uh, reading. And certainly, it's, as I mentioned earlier, difficult to discern these two diseases uh, many times, and especially when both are present at the same time. And so we isolated from these lesions that we saw in this trial, and what we recovered was 50% of early white pathogen and 50% of the brown spot pathogen. And so uh, we really um, thought that that was a success on um, getting a 50 50 mixture when we have so much really white inoculum in the area. Uh, also, as a note, um, when we looked at the, the results from our early white trials as far as which pathogens were present, we had about 80%, between 80 and 100% of early white in those trials, and, and up to as much as 20% uh, of brown spot. So I just want to take a few minutes to summarize. Um, Really what we know, uh, what we're learning is that brown spot is uh, a complex of pathogens. It's called by a complex of pathogens, really as many as three alternaria species. Uh, reduced sensitivity, we know our annual resistance to QOI and SDHI fungicides are, are really widespread in, in all of those alternaria pathogens. Um, the DMIs like WASH and uh, in your case, Sevia, represent uh, older chemistry, but they really, um, the resistance really hasn't developed to those yet. But certainly we always have to, you know, proceed with cautions where, where that's concerned. Um, we also have seen that, that Sevia appears to have some good residual activity, and so that can work, could work in our favor. Um, resistance to the AP fungicides, pyrimethanol mainly, um, has been documented, but really is, is, is still quite rare. Um, certainly we have to keep track of that, and again, always proceed with caution where fungicide resistance is concerned. Um, and really we also have to note that then those isolates uh, with uh, resistance to, to pyrimethanol also very likely have resistance to the QOI and the SDHIs, and so it doesn't leave you with a lot of options in those cases. And so really their la uh, knowledge of the local pathogen population is really very important when we're looking at our fungicide programs. So where we proceed with caution is very important. Um, so resistance continues to develop, to develop, and we really need to, to hang on to the products that we still have and use them wisely. Um, good resistance management, of course, includes rotating and tank mixing. Um, if, you know, important to remember that if you have resistance to one member of the tank mix, then you're really solely relying on that other member to do to do all the heavy lifting. Um, we know that field failures can occur for several reasons, um, but if you do see a field failure, that should be followed up with some evaluations for fungicide resistance. Um, what we've been calling the premium or specialty fungicides, those single site mode of action fungicides, um, really provide a, a better degree of early bite control. And we know that under our moderate to high early bite um, disease pressure conditions, we need those in our rotation in order to optimize our yield and, and really manage early life uh, effectively. And so applying those uh, specialty fungicides kind of in that mid-season um, really gives us the best bang for the buck. So much of this work uh, really was done by many others. Um, as I indicated, Neil Grimstead uh, worked on this for many, many years, and I just have uh, it continued on with some of those projects over the past year. Uh, here listed are many of his graduate students and postdocs uh, that have, have done much of this work. Uh, I'd like to especially mention Dean Peterson and Russell Benz, who manage um, the field trials, all of those data that I sent you and um, certainly all of the important people that worked on this, and as well as our funding sources, uh, funding from the chemical companies as well as from our local growers and grower agencies. So with that, I'd like to um, 
I, I conclude my talk. I certainly am happy to answer any questions that you have right now, uh, or can do so in the future. You have my email address there. I'm happy to um, interact with you and, and discuss things at, at any time. So thank you again very much for your time and attention today. Much for your time and attention today. And that does it for our presentations for day one of the Canadian Spud Congress. But the fun isn't over just yet. We will have the Spud Shed and Exhibition Hall open for the next hour. So please grab a beverage, whether it's coffee or a beer, and stop by the Spud Shed for a visit. I know it's not the same as going to a lounge at a hotel, but at least we can still see each other's faces. And make sure to be back here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Central Time for another day of amazing presentations. Thanks so much, everyone, for taking part today. I hope you've learned some things that will help you on your farm.